welcome. I'm Martin Sung on behalf of CNBC and also the World Economic Forum. Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, panel discussion or debate on supply chains. We're calling it, this is kind of catchy, chain reaction supplying Asia's uh, growth. Now, to help frame this, before I introduce you to uh, the panelists, what I want to do is take a real quick straw poll of the audience. I know it's coming to about, what is it, seven months uh, since the floods here in Thailand where we are. Uh, the worst in, I think, what, more than half a century and things are back to normal. That's the good news. Uh, the maybe bad news is we've got floods potentially coming around the corner, July, July or August. So first things first, raise your hands. How many of you have operations in Thailand? Give me a show of hands. All right, that uh, looks like about half the room. Okay, now with floods coming in July, possibly August, how many of you can honestly raise your hands and tell me we are prepared supply chain wise? Give me another show of hands. Okay, <laughs> this is very good because we've got four experts here to help you kind of try and figure your problems out uh, supply chain wise. Let me introduce you uh, to them in no particular order. Starting from my left, we have uh, Mustafa Mohammed, Minister for International Trade and Industry from Malaysia. Uh, to my immediate left, a uh, good friend of this branded network, in fact, G, I think, still owns less than half of us, 49%. 49. Uh, Stu Dean, Stuart Dean, who is CEO for GE for Southeast Asia, including where we are now, Thailand. To my immediate right, uh, we've had a long, uh, a lot of opportunity to, to talk the, the last few days. Alok Lokia, CEO from Indorama Ventures. This is interesting. This is probably the, one of these rare $8 billion a year companies that you've probably never heard of. He's in polyester, also in wool yarns, but uh, polyester as in PET, the stuff that goes into all your drink bottles and stuff, also makes the stuff that goes into your kids' diapers, by the way. And last but not least, to uh, our far right, we've got Marcelo Claure, am I pronouncing it right? You got it. Yeah. Chairman of the board, CEO, and president of an outfit called Bright Star uh, Corporation. He's in the very specific commoditized handphone or cell phone vertical. Yep. yep. So these are our panelists. What I'd like to do first is uh, start with Stu. Now, Stu and GE, you've got about, what is a billion dollars sunk into this country where yep. we are now, Thailand, and the medical equipment into all sorts of other infrastructure uh, as well. GE being GE, obviously, post the floods last October, there is a plan B. There's got to be, right? It's GE. Tell us what it is. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, we can't say that you know we're 100% prepared for another event like that, yeah. but we're far better prepared uh, than we were last year. Uh, I don't think, uh, well, we've strengthened our business continuity plans. Uh, we have uh, made sure we've got backup sources of supply for key components uh, where necessary, uh, leveraging our global supply chain mm -hmm. uh, to make that happen. Uh, and, I th and for the first time in my 33-year GE history, we've actually conducted a crisis management exercise ah. around flooding okay. and, uh, and, and an earthquake. The first time in your 33 years with the company, but, right. but I mean, I mean we've, we've talked GE, about... Or is flooding just not something that happens a lot in territories where GE right. operates? I don't right. know. I mean, we, we have, we've always had business continuity plans, yeah. but we've never, never really taken our management teams through an exercise until this year. Okay. And that's as a result of what happened in Japan, what happened in Thailand, okay. and in other parts of the world. So we're, right. we're getting better at it, and right. we'll continue to get better. All right, so GE obviously affected by the floods last October, as were, as, you, as I'm sure you all know, uh, automakers, especially the Japanese ones here in Thailand, hard disk drive makers as well. And uh, Minister, let me uh, come to you. It seems to me uh, what the car makers and what the hard disk drive makers and GE is doing could define the shape of supply chains in the future. And I want your take on this to see whether I'm right. Are supply chains necessarily going to have to get longer as well as broader as a result of not just the Thai floods, but also 311 in Japan? We, um, we are neighbors, uh, Thailand and Malaysia. And uh, Stuart was saying about the, the contingency plan that he had. Uh, some of the companies operating in Malaysia operate in Thailand as well. And uh, those companies have been collaborating. So the, uh, the, the reduction in production uh, in Thailand was made up to some extent by an increase in production in Malaysia. 
So that's uh, the val value, the, that's the uh, positive part of being neighbors. Yeah? In other words, the total production has not decreased because of this uh, proximity. So uh, uh, short or long, yeah? uh, in future, uh, I think uh, it's going to be uh, uh, defined by, by the, uh, the business plan yeah? of the various uh, companies. But we found that uh, companies have been able to, uh, of course, there were some interruptions mm. through supply, mm -hmm. hard disk drives, uh, auto components, dairy in our case. Uh, but because of the proximity and because of the close co collaboration Sorry, between the two. Dairy? Uh, we have uh, a company which operates both in Malaysia and Thailand, uh -huh. FNN. Yeah? That's the name of the ah, company. Right, yeah. right, right, of yeah. course. Yeah. So, uh, so, well, you have a plan. But because we are close and we are, we are close neighbors, uh, the impact was mitigated mm -hmm. by the close collaboration between Malaysia and Thailand at the government level, mm -hmm. and also because of the operations which are found in, in both countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK, well, let me come to uh, Alok here. He has a very different take. And we spent quite a lot of time talking about this. Um, before we met for this panel, we spoke on uh, uh, some other occasions uh, while we were interviewing him live. And I happened to mention we're doing this panel on supply chains. And they said, well, look, so what about supply chains? Because for me, I have onshored all my production to the markets or in the markets that I want to sell to. I said, OK, so that sounds smart. But you know, your factories, they need inputs too. Because, ah, I vertically integrated. So you know, tell us your experience. And is this the future for supply chain management or lack of it? Yep. Uh Essentially, you know, we, we also lived through the 97 crisis, the Tom Yam Kung crisis in Thailand. And in that crisis, we were fortunate because at that time, we were an export-oriented company. Mm -hmm. Everything we produced was for the West, and that crisis did not impact the West. So we actually benefited because the bar got devalued and our cost of production came down. But it made us realize that you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've been uh, sort of de-risking our portfolio. And what we have done is we have gone global. We have put 39 sites across the world. Mm -hmm. And we like to produce where our customers are. Mm -hmm. So in that, rent, in that sense, we are de-risking our portfolio. This, this wasn't sort of you, know, you being forward thinking, going like, ah, there are going to be massive supply chain disruptions, so I will onshore. Nothing uh, like that, it, was, right? it was more for de-risking the portfolio. It was more because we could get better market share yeah. by giving more reliability to our customers by being near shore to them, mm -hmm. on shore to them. Mm -hmm. And that is how this whole concept developed for us. Mm -hmm. And also we need to put it in context that we are in the commodity business. Mm -hmm. And in the commodity business, you know, the key success driver is low cost. So we cannot anyways afford the supply chain. Well, we ah, need a very well, hold low on. Cost. This is this is kind of interesting. Low cost, and uh, you know, because when I think of supply chains, I was doing some reading before this panel. Let's say I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Let's say you meet a guy in a bar or at an airport lounge, and you go, "So, what business are you in?" And the guy says, "I'm in supply chains." You know, you probably turn the other way. Like, oh yeah, right, fine, <laughs> thanks. Okay, because back then it was about supply chains was about cutting costs, it was about squeezing out incremental efficiencies for your company. That was about it. Okay? Today, and we can bring Marcelo in on this, a lot of people are looking at supply chain, supply chain management as a top line, as a revenue driver, and a very powerful one. And Apple is probably one of the biggest uh, examples of that. And Marcelo happens to do work for Apple. We were talking, uh, uh, I think, yesterday. I mean, Apple sells its iPhones, iPads, etc. all these iProducts, products, uh, obviously through the telcos, the operators through their pristine uh, uh, marbled stores as well, but also through a third channel, all these more or less generic or anonymous stores, and that's where Marcelo comes in, right? Sure, I mean, so supply chain today, and first of all, I'm excited to see a room full of people that want to talk about supply chain, so that's quite unique. And I think, you know, even the flaws... I, I got to interrupt you here, because <laughs> back there, before we started, he told me, like, look, guys, the last time we tried this, it was at Davos, as a supply chain forum, a panel, and two people showed up. <laughs> they decided to turn it into a roundtable instead, but we're really glad that we've got, I don't know, more than 100 people 
uh, in this room this afternoon. So when I walked ahead. out, I thought some yeah. people had made a mistake, but I guess not. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I think supply chains have become quite relevant today because, I mean, what we've learned from the floods and many other natural disasters, it really tests a country to how, how good a country is from a supply chain. And in the past, traditionally, like you said, supply chain was about cutting costs. And today, you know, we believe supply chain is actually can lead to a competitive advantage. And definitely Apple has shown that they have probably the most advanced supply chain of any kind within the electronic industry. And what do I mean by that? That is, you know, Apple has the capability today, probably one of the few companies in the world that has, that has an end-to-end -end visibility of what happens to their products. And that because each time any of you buy an iPhone, you plug it into a computer, and Apple immediately knows where did you buy it, what region was it activated, in what operator. And that allows them, obviously, to send the right signals in order to produce better, to procure better components, et cetera. And it's no secret that today Apple's supply chain is definitely one of the most advanced, and it has given them a competitive advantage. I do think the same applies to countries, right? I mean, I think countries can measure in the past years to say, hey, how, how logistics friendly are you as a country? I think today, you know, many countries are being evaluated at how good is the supply chain of a country, you know, how good is your transportation, how good is your, you know, how do you process customs, how fast you can move product. So I definitely think the supply chain today, you know, companies that have taken and invested in supply chain are pretty much leaders today in many areas. And so having a great supply chain is a source of competitive advantage. Okay, it's not only about reducing costs. All right, tell you about, give us a very, very specific example of what you do for Apple. This third channel of distribution to the more generic uh, stores where you, where you can pick up an iPhone or an iPad or, or I whatever. How do you help them drive revenue? I mean, I want to say, I mean, we don't, we don't need to pick on Apple necessarily. I mean, you know, we do this for every manufacturer of mobile phones in the world. Uh, we're, we're what he's trying to say is he has a lot of other customers. We are, anyway, we're the yeah. world's largest mobile phone distributor, and what we found, we've built a pretty amazing supply chain that allows us probably to move product to many, many, about a couple of hundred thousand points of sale around the world and do it more efficiently than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we do it through a combination of a global supply chain, a regional supply chain, and an in-country supply chain. Mm -hmm. So that allows, you know, we do, it, we do it better, we do it more cost efficient than many of the leading manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Apple is an example, you know, which we work, but we work with, you know, with RIM, with Motorola, with Samsung, with, sure, with, with pretty a lot much of every brands. one of them, in which there's some specific channels that they want to they have coverage, yeah. and they rely on Bryster as the, as the party that will take those devices to make sure you, they always have the right product, available at the right time, at the right price, pretty mm -hmm. much all over the world. So. Yeah, ju just in time, I guess. Uh, I, I got to ask you. Yeah, Martin, may oh, I go ahead. Ahead. Um, sure. Uh, sure. I'd like to say that actually I fully agree with Marcelo that supply chain can be one's advantage. And actually that's how Indorama, you know, we have grown at the rate of 50% plus over the last seven years each year. And the reason we have been able to grow is because we did uh, the supply chain management in a different way. Okay. We didn't go far distances. We went nearer to our customer. And that itself was a competitive advantage we got from in our business. Mm -hmm. Because all our other polyester makers were all based in Asia. We went to Europe. We went to... You, you have USA. a sh much shorter and uh, more decentralized supply chain. More, what you're saying. more shorter, decentralized supply yeah. chain, more reliable. Mm -hmm. so, so this is what our customers are paying us. Uh, you know, our partnership with our customers is built on more reliability. Mm -hmm. And since we are in the commodity business, we have, uh, we have capacity, we have multiple plants. Yeah. So we don't have to, we don't have a cluster. Okay. So this multiple plant concept near to our customers has right. actually given us a... Okay, so a not, not all customers. your eggs in one basket. And I think, Stu, what uh, GE does with some of its products is a very good example of that. You brought one of them along uh, for some show and tell. Uh, bring it out here. Tell us what it is and why it's such a good example of... Uh, having a spread out diversified uh, supply chain. Yeah, I mean, I th uh, okay. What is that thing? First of all, this is a uh, this is a handheld ultrasound scanning machine. Okay, it is designed for rural markets right. where there's not adequate health care today, and it may be very difficult to find a radiologist or even a clinic with right. scanning equipment. So in your so case, this is Southeast a, Asia, rural markets means countries like this would really almost every country of of ASEAN has a significant rural piece to it, with the exception okay. of, of Singapore. All right. Uh, so an enormous market here. More okay. than half of the 550 million people are not living in the urban markets. Sure. Okay. So obviously so China, India scanner, as well. What, what does it do? Well, I think the, uh, this does basic scanning. 
of uh, various conditions. Uh, in, in particular, we think it's, uh, uh, there's a, a problem with infant and maternal mortality rates in rural areas throughout ASEAN, India, and, and China. And some basic scanning equipment can easily diagnose problems that would allow people to get treated in time you have to, be to, a doctor to, to save it? lives. Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting piece of this thing. In yeah. some cases, regulations need to change to permit midwives to be able to use it. But this is designed for ease of use right. and by midwives, general practitioners. Okay. And then you can send the scans and the images to radiologists mm -hmm. in the inner cities uh, that can uh, read the okay. results. Now, we were talking about this offline uh, uh, behind uh, uh, when we were getting ready, and you were saying right. that, look, this thing, final assembly, is in China. It's in China. But before it gets to that, well, it's, this, is, this product had a very unique history. It was uh, really an idea generated in a Nordic country mm -hmm. um, to try to miniaturize um, scanning equipment. And we moved, it to our, moved the idea to our research center in India, where they executed the concept. But the key was to make it smaller, was to miniaturize the electronics. So we moved that to our research center in China, mm -hmm. who designed the electronics for it. Uh, and so we, we build it, a final assembly in China, but components are sourced from around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, unlike the Indorama business, our industries are very global in nature. So one manufacturing plant will produce enough of these to serve the entire world. Mm -hmm. So we'll never put a factory in every country mm -hmm. around the world. Same, same for aircraft engines, same for gas turbines, mm -hmm. same for locomotives, right? So, but we source components mm -hmm. from the countries that are most competitive right. to create a low-cost global product. And that's, what, that's one key part of global okay. competition is for us. All right, tell you what, let's talk a little bit more about cost competitiveness. Right. This thing is final assembly done in China. I think one of the issues that uh, uh, supply chain managers are going to be grappling with uh, on the cost side is this whole issue of low-cost manufacturing in China. Is it necessarily that low-cost anymore? A lot of people would say probably not, not with wages growing at a 20% clip a year, right? I mean, we know that low-end or, or light industry, that's, that's already started hollowing out significantly from China over the last five, seven years or so, moving to places like Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, even, uh, even Vietnam. And I want to ask you this, Stu. You know, I was talking to somebody uh, a couple of days ago. We were talking about the opening up of, of Myanmar. And he told me that, look, labor costs there, wow, he's looking at that really closely. 60 million people, wages right now, as we speak, are 75% lower than China. I mean, should the legal, should the diplomatic obstacles or hurdles get cleared away? And hopefully they will. I think a lot of you are hoping the same thing. Could this one day be made in Myanmar? Final assembly done in Myanmar. Certainly, you certainly, can't rule it out, right? No, certainly could. Uh, but low wages is not the most important thing about manufacturing. Yeah. You know, a productive, capable workforce is the most important uh, aspect that mm -hmm. we look for. Okay. And uh, we're not in the garment industry or the sneaker industry. Sure. Uh, so I think Myanmar is going to be very attractive long term, mm -hmm. but. Clearly, they need to build the capabilities within their workforce, and, okay. and productivity is the ultimate competitive advantage yeah. Yeah. in our industries. Okay. Minister, I want to put you on the spot here. And you're not the only one because we had another panel earlier today where we were talking to your counterpart from Indonesia, Bagita, Gurjawan. Indonesia and Malaysia have the distinction, at least among some economists, of being uh, newly industrializing or realized Asian economies that are. I mean, the worry, the threat, the fear is both of you, Malaysia and Indonesia, are going to get stuck in what economists call a middle income trap or middle class trap because productivity is not keeping up with wages. How do you answer that? Let me step backwards uh, and talk about what we're doing in ASEAN as a group. We want, uh, as you know, many of you are aware, uh, we would like to um, make ASEAN a single production base. Uh, we would like to encourage companies to exploit the 600 million uh, market uh, growing middle class in ASEAN. And uh, what we're doing is to reduce uh, tariffs are zero by and large, non-tariff barriers, logistics, uh, cross-border movements, flow of goods and services. And this is very important for uh, supply chain management 
you know, operations in Thailand, in Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, mm. uh, in auto components. There's a lot of uh, exchanges. I mean, some parts have been manufactured in, in, in a, a few ASEAN countries and assembled in other countries. So we would like, uh, this is our vision, 2015, when we have a single uh, production base, uh, ASEAN economic community. So at the policy level, uh, ASEAN is giving all the encouragement uh, to companies to locate uh, in the region to supply not only the ASEAN market, mm. but indeed the world. Let me take, take a step backwards. And that, for that reason, we are doing many things to reduce non-tariff barriers. We're working hard to harmonize uh, standards, uh, simplify customs procedures. This is very important for supply chain management. That will reduce your cost, yeah? logistics and all. Time at the ports, yeah? the turnaround time, air connectivity. So this is uh, very important going forward. And by 2015, we believe ASEAN is going to be even more attractive. Sure. The uh, middle income trap, uh, your uh, question. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we've been dealing in the last uh, two, three years in Malaysia. Let me begin by, by Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get out. Uh, countries which were at similar levels of development with us, uh, say 20 years ago, have graduated. And we're stuck in the middle. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Taiwan, for example, has just moved up. Korea, we were at the same level 20 years ago. And that has got to do with, uh, with, uh, with knowledge, in the case of Taiwan, and investment in education, high tech, new industries, more sophistication, mm -hmm. uh, and attracting higher quality investments. And for that reason, they've been able to graduate mm -hmm. to be a high income economy, to be a member of the OECD. So our challenge is to, be, uh, to move out of this trap and be high income economy. So wages have got to go up. Yeah? yeah, productivity uh, as well, though. And of course, productivity. Yeah. And for that, there's got to be uh, uh, heavy investments in education. Yeah. In my country, in Malaysia, we're investing heavily in education, providing the skills that's required. This is very critical for, for us to be able to graduate yeah. and move out of this threat. Okay. So, wages are, uh, yeah. are relatively low at this point of time. Uh, it's, got to, uh, it's got to do with uh, skills, low skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're attracting people like GE and, and other high-tech companies yeah. in IT, for example. Indeed. Yeah? Indeed. So, so that we you're, can, you're yeah. based there in KL, right? I am based in KL. Yeah. Okay. We have more than a thousand employees. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He's based in Kuala Lumpur. Indeed. He, he covers Asia from Kuala Lumpur. Ah, ah. Thank you so much. Yeah? All right. Minister, hold that thought. We'll by, come back. Yeah. And we hope by 2020, mm -hmm. in our case, we get out of this trap. All right. Middle income track. Okay, Minister, we'll continue talking uh, more in just a bit. We're going to take a quick break on this uh, debate, this panel we're having on supply chain management. We'll be coming right back. Don't go away. Okay, guys, so that was our first uh, pretend uh, commercial break. I liked uh, it. We're going to give it Get a couple of minutes. If any of the panelists, would you like a drink? I'll look, Marcelo, do you want some water? Yeah. Are you okay? okay? Well, anyway. That's a fancy bottle. Thank you. Thank you. This PET bottle. <laughs> was it made? It, uh, was it made me? Did the PET come from Indorama? Well, one, one out of three bottles in North America, one out of three bottles in Asia. Europe. Yeah, yeah. Is that so right? It comes from Indorama's PT Polymer. I'll be darned. So now you know, next time you do have a drink. Okay. And uh, the other interesting bit of trivia from Alok was you've got about a one-third share of the market in Europe. Yeah, that's that right? one out of three bottles. Yeah. That's one of the regional, wow. I can't remember now. Uh, <coughs> the center of the region. Would, would, would you want to introduce a concept of how there's a manufacturing renaissance taking place in North America and how ASEAN has to, when we think of how competitive we are, how much more work we need to do? Let's do that. Excellent. Excellent.
Okay, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us uh, for this uh, special debate. We're having a uh, panel discussion on uh, supply chains. Uh, we're coming to you live from the World Economic Forum East Asia happening in Bangkok, the Thai capital. We left off talking to uh, the Malaysian minister about uh, productivity, but during the break, Alok here leaned over and whispered to me, look, I think we should be talking about this manufacturing renaissance happening in the United States and what how Asia needs to respond. So talk to us about that. You know, uh the, the, the idea of making ASEAN more competitive is very noble, but I'm not sure how, how much we rely on how soon we need to do it. Uh, today, 70% of U.S. manufacturing is done onshore, mm -hmm. but I believe that that is gaining traction and they will be doing more and more of that. Okay, tell me why. Because a couple of things have happened. The productivity index, what Stuart was saying earlier, they have increased the productivity of the people. So the regions in America where they have the lowest wages in uh, East, Southeast, and also they have, remember, the NAFTA treaty with Mexico. Sure. Today, Mexico can produce as competitively as Asia and supply to North America. Mm -hmm. But North America or USA itself, especially with the shale gas boom, where, shale, where gas pricing is so low now, mm -hmm they can very competitively supply themselves. Indeed, yeah. And remember, there's a cost penalty, the logistic penalty to move goods from Asia. Mm -hmm. So all in all, delivered prices, in, and I'm talking about commodities, so I'm not fully aware on yeah. stores industry or Marcellus industry, but in commodities, uh, today we can manufacture, and we do manufacture in the U.S. Our plant in uh, Decatur, Alabama, is amongst our 39 sites the lowest cost site in our group. It's lower than our Chinese Globally? Site. Globally. Lower, lower than, than your uh -huh. Indonesian site, Chinese site, which are other two low okay. cost sites. Are your workers unionized? Sorry? <laughs> are your workers unionized? <laughs> no, we, we, we take care of our workers. Right. In petrochemicals, we don't need too many workers. That is one thing that you need to. Okay, it's fairly, know. fairly automated. So we only have a hundred people producing 500 kilotons, yeah. producing 700 million dollar of sales. So labor component is not too important. It, it, so that. it's not wages that makes your plant there. It's logistic cost, which is more important ah. in, in our business. Okay, that's why we do on onshoring. Mm -hmm. But my point is that that same renaissance is coming in other industries, and North America is going to get very, very competitive, mm. and it's happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. So Asian economies which were dependent on exporting themselves out in the past, I think, and I was very happy with the plenary session this morning where the ministers and the panelists took cognizance of this that mm -hmm. we have to rebalance our portfolio. We cannot depend on remaining an export-based economy. We got to get consumption going. And that's why in that yeah. context, I agree with the raising of wages mm -hmm. because I believe that that will help increase the societal uh, the upliftment of the mm -hmm. consumption. Mm -hmm. And we need to drive domestic consumption up for sure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can go on and on on this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like the onshoring or the inland in, in China, they're taking manufacturing from coastal to inland. Now that's amazing, that's great. Yeah. Because again, that's going to bring a lot of economic development inland that will create so much more economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. For every manufacturing job created, there's three uh, indirect jobs created. Mm -hmm. So just, I think China would manage its problems. Mm -hmm. But for ASEAN, how are we going to manage it? And to the minister's point, are we allowing each other to use our resources? Uh, are we going to lay pi pipelines? Are we going to lay railway networks? Mm -hmm. How are we going to get logistics really cheap? Mm -hmm. If you're going to truck them, it's not good enough. We need to put them through pipelines. Sure. Are we going to have that confidence or are we going to protect our resources for ourselves? Mm, so mm. how is ASEAN going to become one? So there are, you know, saying things is easier than getting them done. Sure. But once that recognition is there, 
ASEAN has been in trouble in the past. ASEAN has faced challenges, and ASEAN will also take care of itself yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I'm happy that the recognition is taking place. Mm. That's my point here. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Let's Could, get back to Stu. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I would love to jump in on this. Yeah. So, I mean, GE definitely believes there's a renaissance going on in manufacturing in the United States. But I think there are limits as to how, how many plants are going to be moved back uh, to the U.S. And jobs as well. And jobs. Okay. Right? Um, increasingly, all the growth is in the fast-growing emerging markets and commodity-rich countries mm -hmm. around the world. And GE wants to have a footprint in those countries as well. So right. although we're building, I think, four new manufacturing plants in the United States right now, including some in the Midwest and Detroit and Dayton, Ohio, uh, right in the middle of the Rust Belt because there is highly skilled, productive labor there, we're also building new plants in Vietnam, in China, in India, mm. expanding in uh, our aircraft engine repair and overhaul facility in, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we got to be investing where the growth is. I yeah. think uh, that there's been, of course, a bit of both. I mean, there's been uh, some success in getting some of these companies uh, back to America to create jobs. But overall, I think uh, uh, there's been a net outflow of uh, investments to the emerging markets. Mm. America is one example where there is a conscious policy of bringing back the jobs uh, with some success. I must say it's not uh, too successful at this point of time. As Stuart just said, uh, the, uh, uh, the action is where the market is. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, for example, I mean, that's not another model that because of the shrinking population, uh, because of uh, very, uh, you know, low growth in, the, in Japan. Therefore, as you know very well, Japanese companies are moving up. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have a, a model in America which is, uh, you know, which is uh, working uh, to some extent, but by and large, I mean, in the case of Malaysia, we still, have, st still do have American companies increasing these investments in America, despite this policy in America. Mm -hmm. But certainly in the case of Japan, we can see uh, a bigger interest on the part of Japanese companies. And I totally agree. And I said. Uh, so I'm, I'm, but before that, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to see the, uh, uh, are you saying that with onshoring, uh, the uh, supply chain management uh, is not going to be um, no, it's Political. very important, the supply chain management, and I'm taking pipelines, railway networks yeah. as all part of the supply chain management. And I agree with you on the Japan. Uh, Japan is going to further offshore its manufacturing, especially the Fukushima earthquake and the nuclear crisis last year. That's not done any good in the sense now there is no political will to put nuclear power. Mm. Now, energy cost is a key differentiator for USA today. So the utility cost that we pay in North America is far less than what we pay in Asia and also Japan, uh, also Europe. Mm. So obviously all my comments are based on my industry. Uh, but Japan is going to lose manufacturing more and more. Sure, sure. Marcel, you want to jump in on this? I mean, to us, I'll tell you a different story in terms of, and this is a unique uh, thing that we do. We use the US as a great supplier of raw materials and use them. And what do I mean by that? Oh. There's something pretty unique happening in our industry today, and that is in the US what we do is we buy used mobile phones from the US because the US is, a, is the country where today people pay the highest for a mobile phone. And then after one and a half years, after the contract expire, you know, traditionally those mobile phones used to go into the drawers. I mean, there's about five billion mobile phones sitting in the drawers. And what we found today is we buy those mobile phones from the US a great source to us of raw material. We find a low-cost refurbishing facility somewhere around the world, and then we utilize those new devices to put them into emerging markets like the Asian markets or other markets like Africa or Middle East and all that. This is a very so, interesting story. I, I, I've always wondered about that. I've got like seven in my drawer. You Who <laughs> refurbishes these phones? You recycle them? Or? No, so what, what we found is, I mean, Recondition. You know, I mean, most people don't know, but a, a, a smartphone today, you know, in the United States, cost about $100 because it is heavily subsidized, but the true cost of that device is in the five to $600 range. Ah. So after a year, year and a half, we buy those devices, and then you know we have remanufacturing facilities in Mexico, we have them in Latin America, we have them in Africa, we have them in Asia, and we refurbish those devices, and then we've created a whole new market that markets you know, many of the Asian markets in which the, the per capita uh, uh, is not as high as the US. It allows people to have ah. you know, a it's like new 
iPhone, like that new Blackberry and all so that. So your material is coming from, from seas? It's, it's, it's raw so material. It's, a, it's quite unique. So now in the past, you know, that raw material used to sit, I don't know how many of you, when you open your drawer, you're going to find that you have two or three mobile phones. Yeah. So we figure out a way how to do that. So it's unique. So we, what we try to do around the world is find this type of opportunities this in an is industry. really interesting. And believe it or not, I mean, you know, in the next couple of years, we should be shipping 25, 30 million phones that are like new. A year? Like new devices, like, yeah, like new devices a, a year. A year. A year. Yeah. So okay. So look, help me do the math here. You know, the unsubsidized cost of a phone in the U.S., five, six hundred bucks, right? You buy them back or buy them over, send them to your refurbishing centers, then you bring them out here to uh, Southeast Asia or somewhere sure. in Asia, and you sell them off after a year, right? What is the one-year depreciation, uh, depreciation on a $600 phone? And after you put in the cost of refurbishing, how much can they sell for out here in Asia? I'm just curious. I mean, so what we found is a device will go for about 50% the price of a new device. And that's a big deal because, you know, we all want to have a phone, especially, you know, people that cannot afford to have a high-end phone. Yeah. At the end of the day, when you walk out of a shop, your phone is used the following day. Yeah. So, you know, there's a big discount in, you know, and that allows us to reach who traditionally people will buy a lower-end phone. Now they can have a like-new phone. Mm -hmm. And knowing that the mobile phone today is the number one status symbol, and a lot of people love to just put their cell phone in a table to say, mm -hmm. hey, I can afford this phone. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been able to put in, in many different markets, we've given people the chance to have a, you know, a phone that otherwise they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. And I say that because, I mean, it's, you know, it's amazing how we build an industry for an industry that didn't exist, an industry where today, you know, not only is good because we're giving access to technology to people that didn't have it, but more importantly, I don't think there's a bigger waste from an environment Thank you. Yes. that 5 billion mobile mm. batteries sitting in, in, in this thing about it. There's 5 billion. That's among, I mean, that's, divide how many people exist. Mm. Is it you know, recycled another yeah. round or just one? Oh, I mean, it, I mean, mobile phones have a way to recycle, depending on the market, a couple of times and in the past. So, so that's, that's a business that we're in and that's a business that, uh, you know, we love to be in because it's great for the environment. But more importantly, we've created something out of nothing. Is that a pretty simple supply chain, though? It's, it's, quite, it's a quite a complex supply chain. Uh, okay, I mean, just it's, describe it, it. It's simple because it's easy to know what a consumer is going to trade in. So you, all you do is you analyze what did an operator like Verizon in the U.S. bought 18 months ago, and we can pretty much predict what is a consumer going to turn in 18 months later. Yeah. Now what we got to do is we got to go and figure out, probably the most difficult thing is do you invest in a mobile phone? So we're buying all these millions of mobile phones, and it's similar to the used car business. Do we invest more money to make it a like new device, or do we just auction them as, as, as they a, are. a used device? And by the way, there's a huge used device market around the world too. Yes, obviously. So yeah. we got to make sure that we buy, that we source the right components that in order for us to be able to refurbish those devices. And obviously the quality, quality is, is it's extremely important, right? Mm. So we got to make sure that our refurbishment centers are as good as the original factory that made mm. those devices. And there is a lot of demand for these refurbished phones? Well, there's, I would say there's, there's unlimited demand. There's more demand that we can supply. Mm. It's pretty simple. I mean, you know, uh, we'll, we'll skip Apple for now and we'll just use <laughs> Samsung, right? You know, a Samsung <laughs> device uh, that costs $500. Imagine if you as an end user can procure it for $250 a year later. Yeah. You, know, you, want to, you know, you want to have access to that technology. So, there's pretty much, I would say, unlimited demand for high-quality remanufacturing devices like new. Mm, mm, interesting. What about the recycling business, what uh, the minister was talking about? Are you thinking about getting into that as well? Because that could be an offshoot, of, a pretty easy offshoot of that supply chain, no? So, so we do. We do the recycling. We do the refurbishment of those devices. And wow. one of the things that we're doing is a lot of those devices have no use. So what we figure out ways how to responsibly get rid of those devices in order to create the least amount of harm to the environment possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. And I mean, if you talk about recycling, I mean, what we do is we take every single piece that's left in a mobile phone in order for us to use that component, you know, in the refurbishing the next one. So we, we have about a 70% yield. So for every mm. 100 phones that come in, you know, used devices, we're able to take out mm. 70 new devices. And, and a lot of mm. that comes, you know, of pulling parts out of those mobile phones and putting them in into yeah. that like new mobile phone. Yeah, come to think of it, I looked, I mean, do you, are you into that business? Do you do that? Because I mean, the, the, the bottles that we had during the break, easily recyclable, no? It, and it is, yeah. and, and that's the attractiveness of PET bottles. 
because it can get recycled again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So they say in China, the PET bottle gets collected even before it hits the floor or the, or, or the garbage mm -hmm. because the, it also creates uh, employment, mm -hmm. second employment, and every PET bottle can go back either into a carpet, into a fabric, mm -hmm. or back into a bottle. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that, that's what makes polyester grow by 7% per cent an annum. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are Europe's largest recycler ourselves. Ah, interesting. And we are going to leverage that, take that more into Asia. Mm. So we are building a recycling plant in Thailand as we speak. Oh, is that mm. right? I didn't know that. So, mm. so, so that's the attractiveness of so a greener planet and so it's, it's an attractive business, a growing yeah. business, yeah. and it's a green business. Okay, per capita income, Minister, in uh, Malaysia is significantly higher than our host country here. Uh, it, it's a fact that's nothing to be uh, embarrassed about. So it would seem that a plant like what Alok is talking about would, uh, would be a pretty good fit in Malaysia as well, going by the amount of, I don't know, bottled water or drinks or stuff that's consumed in your country. Yeah, it, it is a growing industry. And in the case of Marcelo, perhaps uh, I'm keen to know, interested to know what percentage of your business uh, is uh, made up of this, uh, the recycling of uh, smartphones. And uh, I, I mean, the, the way you've been telling us, both of you, Alok and Marcelo, is going to be a bigger uh, component. And uh, in all our countries, we're encouraging, uh, in Malaysia as well, we have incentives uh, to encourage the, uh, the growth of the green business, uh, very generous, uh, very liberal. We encourage you guys to uh, invest. Of course, it cannot be, uh, <laughs> it cannot be uh, toxic and all those things. The environment is, is, is very important. Uh, people are very conscious yep. of the environment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when it comes to recycling, uh, some can be, uh, the waste can be quite hazardous. So yep. one's got to, got to be mindful of that. Is that true, Alok? It is, right? Yeah. How but do you what, deal with it? Chemicals and... Uh, basically, that is... <clears throat> Uh, everything that's got produced yeah. and all the waste goes back within the plant. Mm. So whatever polymers we produce in the plant which are not uh, sellable grade, this get recycled back into the plant itself. Okay. And then these bottles that go out in the market, mm -hmm. they get collected back. And like I said, since it creates okay. additional employment. All right. Sorry to interrupt. I think your question was uh, what we were just describing, this type of business. How much does that account for overall? Was that what you yeah. wanted to know? Yeah. yeah. And today, you know, today we're a company in size. I mean, we're probably one of the lesser known, even more lesser number of the size of Brister this year is about eight and a half billion dollars around the world in terms of what we do. And our recycling business today or, or like new business today is probably, I don't know, three, four hundred million dollars. So about 10 percent. But we, we do believe and I it's mean, growing. This is definitely a growing area. And that is one that, you know, we do like because it's a you know, it's, a, it's one in which you add a lot of value. You're providing, again, technology that otherwise people couldn't afford. Boy, it sounds easier making, making locomotives, huh? Very interesting. Well, actually, I think there's a, there's a big analogy here to our big infrastructure businesses okay. because the, uh, the products that we make have to last 25, 30 years, mm. and so they have to be constantly overhauled. So take our, it sounds like a very similar process, and it's, and it's is more difficult than manufacturing new. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, to take example, our aircraft engine business, right? So an engine comes off a plane for overhaul, like our shop in KL. So we disassemble it there. We send parts to over 25 component repair facilities around the world, some GE, some suppliers. Mm -hmm. Those have to, that work needs to be done, then sent back to the repair and overhaul shop where it's reassembled and then back on the wing of the aircraft. And all of that has to happen within 50 days. And we compete on delivery times mm -hmm. in that industry. So another reason yeah. why supply chain is so critical uh, in these industries, and it sounds very similar to yeah. the mobile phone business. So I didn't think we had much in common, Marcelo, but I'm But hey, uh, what do you know? Wow. Interesting stuff. Minister, uh, Marcelo brought up this point, and I think I look at it as well, that uh, we have to think of supply chain management at a national level too, whether a country's infrastructure is up to scratch to facilitate business in the free flow of goods, capital, etc. Uh, and I have to ask you, and uh, this is a blunt question, Malaysia of course has excellent infrastructure, I have to say, but it is also known for after building these fantastic pieces of infrastructure, not necessarily maintaining them 
that well. Is this changing? It's changing. It's a challenge. And there used to be a saying, we have uh, first world uh, infrastructure when it comes to maintenance and those things, not up to the mark, but uh, we are determined and committed to, uh, to maintain a maintenance, the budget for maintenance has mm -hmm. been increased for mm -hmm. government and uh, the culture of maintenance is very important. And we, we have made uh, lots of improvements uh, in the last uh, couple of years and I can assure you that we'll continue uh, to ensure that, I mean, we have good infrastructure. You go to our airport, um, oh, still, yes. the airport is 15 years old, 98, 2012, uh, and uh, it's still in very good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one good example. The highways are well maintained. Uh, and, uh, but of course, we continue to make improvements. Uh, uh, I am, Martin, I'm just keen as a policymaker, uh, from your perspective, what is it that you want us to do in the government uh, to facilitate the movement of goods, mm -hmm. to reduce costs, yeah? uh, especially, especially, especially in ASEAN. We've done a lot of things uh, to reduce, uh, uh, of course, uh, non-tariff barriers, trying to uh, uh, make standards more uniform, yeah? uh, customs harmonization, with single window, uh, many initiatives. But uh, we are keen to know what else we need to, to do in ASEAN so that we become more attractive. Malaysia and other countries in ASEAN can be more attractive where some of these companies can be lo located as part of the global supply chain. That would be useful for us. Yeah? You know, it just so happens, I was talking to uh, uh, people at the ADB and also at the World Bank, and part of this whole ASEAN economic community Mm -hmm. idea, single market, the connectivity, etc., the physical connectivity, infrastructure, uh, you know, these ADB and World Bank people were saying, you know, what they want to do is they want to get out of this business. Not so much, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, get out of it in the sense uh, uh, of financing it. They're looking at public-private partnerships, A, and they want to uh, 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 have more of an advisory sort of technical expertise help uh, sort of level. So. I'm wondering whether you see things developing that way. Public-private partnership. Yes, yes, for infrastructure development. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, we started. Uh, we have started privatization. Yeah. Uh, we are pioneers. Of course, uh, that will be 100% uh, private ownership, the highways, and then now we are on public-private partnership. Uh, it's very important because of uh, more efficient yeah. uh, and, of course, budgetary constraints, and that will help uh, boost development. Mm. Uh, uh, in terms of model, uh, we are uh, very much into it in Malaysia okay. and I believe uh, in some other parts of ASEAN as well. Excellent. Good to know. PPP. All right. Listen, hold that thought. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here and we'll come back in just a couple of minutes to continue our panel talk on uh, supply chain management. Don't go away. Next will be the Q&A. Yes.
transferable to, I don't know, a computer or something? Sure, anyway. sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay, welcome back uh, to our World Economic Forum panel on supply chain uh, management. Uh, we've come to just the, the final part of the, uh, this event, and what I'd like to do now is to open it up to the floor, to the audience. We've got what looks to be, I don't know, about 100 over people uh, in this room. And uh, take your questions or comments. All you have to do is raise your hand, and Mike will come to you. to tell us who you are, your name, and also uh, your affiliation or, or, or where you're from. That would help to uh, uh, inform and, and frame your question. And of course, let us know who the question is for. Any takers? Sir, the gentleman uh, right there. There you go, okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Tim Moylan from SAP. It's a general question for all your panel members. I'm interested in how they manage supply chain risk. Is it a matter of spreading your bets across various countries or you know, placing your bets in one country but being very prepared? How do you manage supply chain risk as a company and as a policymaker? And as a policy member. Okay, who would like to take that? You know, at Indorama, basically, we are managing it by having multiple plants. And as Stuart said, that's not a model that fits them. Mm. But for our industry, we can build scale, up, scale at each location where our customer is. And not just one plant. So we have in North America, we have five plants, which does similar products. So the way we, we manage risk is that there can be accidents, there can be incidents. We had a typhoon in Decatur, Alabama last year, this time, where for, I think our plant was down for, for three months. But then we had four other sites which could still come to continue to cater to our customer. So we didn't lose a single customer. We lost some sales, but we didn't lose a single customer. Okay, you have fairly good continuity in that, is what you're saying. Wow, interesting. Okay. And I, I would just add yeah. backup suppliers as well. Um, you know, manufacturers don't have to do everything themselves, so redundancy can come in the, in the form of suppliers. For, for governments, what's important is to uh, reduce the, uh, the barriers at the border, so the waiting time, the customs, the procedures, and we have done a lot uh, in that direction, but uh, we know that a lot more needs to be done. That's very important to re reduce risk. I mean, when the time taken to move goods from uh, Thailand to Malaysia, you know, say a couple of days, that will uh, increase the risk and of course, the cost of doing business will go up. So we're committed to reduce the cost of doing business and customs and border clearance is a very important issue hmm. for many companies and we are very mindful of that right. as, as countries of ASEAN. Okay, Marcel? Yeah, and one of the business that we have is we manage supply chains for the operators, the mobile phone operators. And that's a critical, it's so critical for them to make sure that we're always going to ship those devices to the stores or to the end users when they order. So probably the most important decision that we take is where are we going to operate our regional hubs, right? Because there's always going to be some disasters, there's always going to be issues in the countries, but the key is, you know, what, what hub is going to take on that specific country? And for that, you know, we do a lot of study and we do a lot of partnership with the government to figure out, for example, our, our Asian distribution hub is in Singapore or European hub is in London, or Latin American hub is not in Latin America, it's in Miami. And from there we do it. And those are what we call the secondary hubs in order for us to avoid. And some of our contracts, I mean, don't allow us to be later than four hours when we're delivering a mobile phone. So the regional hubs are key to us in order to supplement the in-country or the local hubs. Okay. Uh, ah, Tai Hui. Hi, Tai Hui from Standard Chartered. Um, we speak about the physical disruption in supply chains. How about the financial disruption, uh, given what's happening in Europe, the potential of uh, squeeze of liquidity, dollar shortage? Are you concerned? And if you are, uh, what have you done to mitigate such risks? Oh, terrific question. Uh, who, who would like to tackle that? Um, uh, that is my big concern at the moment for, uh, you know, we are in consumer necessities. So from a, from a demand perspective, we are not concerned quite a resilient industry. But what we are concerned is for our small and medium enterprises, our customers, who may, may have an impact from a banking crisis in Europe. So what we are really fearful is that they may consider us as the lenders, which we don't want to be to them. So uh, we do extend credit, and we have started paying a higher premium to get our customers insured. Yeah. So we do credit insurance and protect ourselves. 
think the point here is that you've got to look, look at the whole ecosystem. Uh, it's not just the uh, physical movement of goods, not only on shoring or having uh, uh, you know, China plus one or two policy uh, spreading your risk, but it's also about financial and small medium enterprise. I think that's a very important point. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Financial disruption can, be, yeah. can, can, can derail whatever plans you have in terms of uh, supply chain All right, management. Sue, so right, so you're keeping real quiet. But I have to ask you know, because, I, I mean, look, GE has a huge, and I mean a huge financing arm. By the way, right. GE... And, and, GE. We're in the, <laughs> and we're in the infrastructure business, and you, you cannot be an infrastructure business and not, have, not be willing to yeah. either arrange or provide financing yourself yeah. uh, for these projects, whether it's power generation, aircraft leasing, uh, financing so that, does that mean the GE is much more insulated or much better insulated from the kind of shocks that Taihui is talking about? Well, first, you know, first of all, we cannot finance yeah. everything, all the projects where we want to sell to. Mm -hmm. So we need great partners like Stanchart and others, including local banks, uh, <laughs> all through uh, the ASEAN region. Yeah. But increasingly, we are looking to use our own balance sheet mm -hmm. in GE to mm -hmm. help finance projects. And, you know, one of the nice things about being GE is when we invest in a project that better enables the project developer to bring other people on board to, yeah. to finance it. But yeah. it's, a, it's a key, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, certainly there's some signs of liquidity uh, pressures in Asia, but I don't see big signs at this point. Right. Okay, I will, that's pretty good. I, I will tell you something that's gonna make the minister quite proud. I mean, one of the areas where, you know, as we sell our products to more than 180,000 companies spread around the world, credit risk is a huge concern. And my Malaysian team came up with something that now we're implementing in Europe, and that is in, we couldn't afford to give all the credit that our customers needed, so we started putting our own credit card machines in the stores of those third parties. So as somebody came in and bought a mobile phone, as they swiped the credit card, the money came directly to us, and we just paid a commission. So we changed the game completely. Now, when we look at Europe, you know, we're starting to face the same problem, right? I mean, you know, we, the, 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 your risk tolerance for giving credit, you know, it becomes smaller and smaller. And if you don't provide credit to these merchants, they're, they're, they're eventually going to go out of business. So what we found is that Malaysian innovation that our Malaysian team came up with, now we're putting in countries where we see a potential, uh, you know, credit failures or credit risk. And we are getting to the point where it's our inventory that sits in the customer's point of sale and therefore the money flows directly to us. So we've changed the game so they become sort of like an agent and therefore you know, we avoid taking that credit risk. So I think crisis forces you to just look at the world different in terms of how do you conduct your business differently. Wow, that's pretty innovative, interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question? I'm seeing some people scratching their heads but nobody raising their hands, nope. Ah, yes sir, gentleman in the front row. Thank you very much. Vijay Punusami from Etihad Airways, Abu Dhabi. You mentioned a number of uh, human factors dealing with uh, the supply chain. Can I ask the panel members if there was one government related factor they could pinpoint which would help so the supply chain, which would that be? Either something which governments can do or stop doing, which would actually help the supply chain getting smoother. Okay, I'll leave the minister last to respond, but who would wanna, who wants to take first crack at this? I think the minister asked that question, right? Yeah, and I that think- That was my one, question. Okay. Yeah, and I, th I think we, we didn't answer it, so I'll take a stab at it. I think one of the main problems that government has, especially in emerging in parts of the world, is they think that low labor, you know, low cost of labor is the most mm -hmm. important thing, and that's mm -hmm. absolutely wrong. I mean, for us to go invest into a country, you know, the basic things, we, we want productivity. And productivity ah. might mean, you know, Myanmar might have the lowest, you know, the lowest cost of labor, but if you don't pair that with productivity, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be more expensive. Secondly, it's infrastructure, right? We need infrastructure to move our goods. And, it, and we need great infrastructure because the velocity is, is extremely important for us. And thirdly, the most important is a highly skilled workforce, right? 
it is important for governments to invest in their people in order for us to attract investment because today is a highly competitive market, right? And even within this community, you know, we got to make a decision. Do we put our, our recycling plant? Do we put it in Malaysia? Do we put it in Indonesia? Do we put it in Vietnam? And those are the three key factors that we look before we're going to make an investment into a country. So it's not just low cost of labor. It's low cost of labor, you know, it's productivity, it's great infrastructure, and having a skilled workforce. So in other words, what you're saying is you're looking for, as an investor, potential investor, a government that invests, A, in infrastructure, and a government that, B, invests in education. In its people. Or, or training. In its yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, I absolutely agree with what Marcelo said, and I think in that respect, Malaysia is a country where the education system is pretty high, and the rest of the countries like Indonesia and Thailand can still do a lot more on that front. Mm -hmm. But additionally to those factors, I think uh, uh, strong and low cost utility supply, mm -hmm. electricity supply is very key and I see that as an issue going forward because we are all fossil based. The network is mostly fossil based. Mm -hmm. So that is a, and, and if, the, if the political will to not to nuclear power, then that could be an issue going forward. Sure, thanks, Stu. I, I think what everybody has said is spot on, but since the question was really focused on human factors, and since I think we've all agreed today that supply chain is a critical way to compete, what we really need are greater critical thinking skills in that particular function, and, uh, and, and, an, innov and an approach to innovation and innovating in the supply chain to improve delivery times, lower the cost, uh, reduce the risks uh, in the supply chain. So I th I th we need better people in that function, I think, mm. generally speaking. Uh, okay, last, GE. okay, last word goes to the minister. Now, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I think your question was if there was one thing, if you had to narrow it down, right, that governments could or should do to improve supply chains in their economies, what would it be? Am I right? Yes. So if you had to pick one, what would it be, Minister? I think the, uh, the well, efficiency and ease of movement uh, of goods, I think that, that's, that's very critical. I mean, in that, of course, your productivity and all those, you know, encompass in that. But I think it's all about efficiency, uh, ease of movement, no obstacles, a seamless kind of, these are very important. And uh, thank you for your, you know, question. Uh, and then the panelists have, have answered question which I posed earlier. <laughs> Thank you a lot for raising the issue of utilities. I think uh, this is useful for us. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we've got time for probably uh, one more question. Anybody want to take a stab? There you go. Gentleman in the front row. There's one in the back. Too. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there one in the back as well? Uh, if you don't mind, because we've done the front row, let's give somebody at the back end an opportunity. Please. All right. My name is Tunku Yakub from Malaysia. I have a question with regards to supply chain of raw materials, key raw materials in ASEAN to get them to the right um, uh, markets. From the government point of view, what can governments do to make sure the resources that are in ASEAN are allocated and deployed to the right markets? For in example, all the um, coal in Indonesia, how can you get them into the right markets? All that gas that we have in East Malaysia, uh, how is that going to be deployed to West Malaysia, to Thailand, so that the economies of ASEAN can grow from the natural resource that we have in the region? So my question is really, what can governments do and what should they do? Okay, uh, I suppose that would be the, for the, the minister. The nature of, of business is very global. Uh, of course, uh, some coal from Indonesia has been exported to Malaysia and other ASEAN countries, but some of that coal goes to China and probably more and more of that. So there's, no, there's nothing to guarantee that resources in ASEAN will go to uh, countries within ASEAN. I mean, that's the nature of business. Uh, it's got to do with the business model. Uh, but uh, I agree with you. Uh, uh, it, it, that's what you are uh, trying to get at, which is uh, resources within ASEAN, perhaps, you know, uh, to develop uh, ASEAN. Uh, there's got to be some kind of uh, preference given to demand from other ASEAN countries, whether it is gas. And uh, in the case of our situation, of course, uh, my friend is talking about gas. Uh, gas from East Malaysia has been exported to Korea and, and Japan, mm. not to other parts of Malaysia, which is an issue being faced by some industries in Malaysia. Why is it that Malaysian gas 
is being sent to uh, Japan and Korea at the expense of Malaysian. Uh, what is the short answer a business. to that? It's got to do with contracts and pricing. And that's the nature mm. of business. Mm. If, if I could yeah. jump in sure. and add, um, you know, I think for the most part, free trade works in the basic commodities like coal and gas, as the minister points out. But we have had examples, particularly in rare earth materials, where certain countries have tried to keep the reserves in their country and not make it available outside. And, and that's a big problem, okay. right? And that's why free trade agreements, I think, are critical mm. to, uh, to the supply chain. All right, fair enough. All right, folks, we have to uh, leave it there. That's going to do it for this, uh, our session, our panel on supply chain management. Uh, we'd like to thank our panelists, the minister, of course, Studine, Alok Lokia, Marcelo Calri, and, of course, yourselves uh, for coming here and joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's fun. Yeah. Thanks for bringing. Uh, thanks for bringing your. Uh